Okay. So thanks, Robin. Thank you for being here today. And I'm excited to talk to you about your journey in becoming an RDI certified consultant. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. So uh, as you know, Lisa, I'm a speech language pathologist. I've been practicing now for uh, 20 years. Um, so I've had a career all in pediatrics. So I've worked with uh, kids right from birth to 18 and everything in between. Um, I was in the public sector working for a public health unit for the first 10 years of my career. And then following that went into private practice. So I've now been in private practice for uh, 10, almost 11 years. Um, so, uh, the, the way I came to find, uh, to find you, Lisa, in the RDI program was uh, I'd been in practice uh, many years doing traditional speech and language therapy and seeing good results with some kids, but with other kids not seeing the type of results that I was hoping for. So I would be working on training certain skills that were lagging. Um, and not necessarily seeing change that was sustained over time, or I wasn't seeing generalization, or I wasn't really seeing the true growth that we were looking for, and particularly with uh, kids with autism. So mm -hmm. that's how I, I uh, that's my background, and that's how I've come to uh, practice in RDI, as well as maintaining my practice in speech pathology. Wonderful. Yeah. And you're located? I'm in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Canada, so way up north. Yep, mm -hmm. the great white north. Well, it's very hot here now, so but <laughs> often the great white north. <laughs> right, right. And I would say, based on my understanding of that, your neck of the woods is that there's um, uh, always need for more services, and that there there isn't necessarily a ton of resources where you are. You the only private speech path in your area. Uh, we have a few. We have, uh, there are three private speech pathologists here, but I'm the only one who is just doing pediatric work. So the other speech pathologists do a mixture of uh, pediatric and adult uh, work. But yeah, there is, uh, we do have, we're more limited in, in the resources, I guess, and services in some ways. Uh, our waiting lists tend to be a bit shorter here than in Southern Ontario, but yeah, it is, families are definitely looking to uh, make those connections locally where they can have services at home. So I'm wondering how has your training in RDI, because you're now a certified RDI consultant, how has your training um, altered or enhanced the, the way that you already work with families and children? Yeah, well, in so many ways, I guess to highlight some of the more important ways it's influenced my practice uh, has me thinking about those uh, underlying skills or foundations that uh, children require in order to really to make progress and for that development to happen. So as speech language pathologists, we are trained in the early development of communication skills, for example, and other, and other developmental skills. But there are some really critical foundations that we don't really receive as much information about in our graduate training programs. And even in our own experience in the field, without having that information, it's really hard to know uh, that we're missing some of the really early underlying foundations. And so that I found uh, knowing what those were and how to help parents to work on those, to work towards developing those has really made a big difference in terms of outcomes for these kids and, and families. So I think that would be probably one of the main ones. Um, another way it's influenced my practice is uh, we, as speech pathologists, we often do use uh, parent coaching models. Um, so we're familiar with things like the Hannon program or just having parents involved in our sessions and doing home programming is, is all about parent coaching. But this brought my skills of parent coaching to a whole new level, um, partly because in RDI, uh, there are parent goals that uh, we have families work towards. And so knowing what some of those goals are that parents themselves need to work on in order to be optimal guides for their child or to really have the understanding that they need to have to work effectively with their kids made a big difference for me. Um, and also I think the fact that RDI is in essence, it is just a parent coaching model, not just as a not meaning that it isn't something where we as therapists are working directly with these kids as the therapist and then part of it is parent coaching. The parent coaching piece is not a side piece but more of the, the focus of it. Um, so that as well has been uh, 
I've been able to see more results. I've been able to see the work be more effective, but I've also had that joy of seeing parents move from more of an observer role where they don't feel empowered to really being um, that, that, that guide for their child and that advocate for their child and really having the confidence to move forward that they have the skills, they have the abilities to be that person for their child. So I would say, you know, on those two, those two are probably the most important ways that it's changed my practice. Yeah. If I really sat and thought about it, I think there would be so many ways there, you know, you almost, I almost can't split anymore. Uh, my role as a speech pathologist and my role as an RDI consultant, they're just completely intertwined at this point. So even for those kids who, uh, who don't have autism, uh, perhaps, and aren't on uh, receiving the RDI program or engaging that program, I'm still bringing elements forward from, from that training. And it's just all packaged together now. It's my best practice. So Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful to hear. And what you've said about the parent coaching model it reminds me of that proverb about you can uh, give a man a fish or you can teach a man to fish. And, uh -huh. you know, and, and in RDI as professionals, we often talk about how we are striving to work ourselves out of a job. Absolutely. And, and, and it's, it's really, um, it, it's so powerful to be able to see that occur where the parents themselves are um, have become so good at learning from their experiences and guiding their children that that they don't really need us so much anymore. And um, and it's one of the best feelings I can remember uh, early on in my career when I had a, a seasoned client who had done her video analysis of her work with her child, and I read it over and I watched the video and I thought, yep. I agree. Yes, I agree. Yes, that's what I would do next. Yes, I agree. And then I remember feeling a little bit kind of like, oh, I don't know how I can help anymore. And then I thought, but you did, but it's okay, because this is exactly what I wanted, was I wanted to work myself out of a job and to see this come to fruition where the parent was able to um, really shine and, and, and was, had become so empowered. It, it really is, it's, it's joyous really like you said you, you it really is this way. yeah yeah and yeah. they and their discoveries that they're making along the way it's it's really cool so and with that said then our work is is much more um, I think has it, it's much more long-standing and that the parent can take that with them every day and 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 they know how to help support the neural integration in their child's mind and to build the child's mm -hmm. mind in RDI, Dr. Gutstein sometimes says that we want parents to become mind-minded, you know, to become mind-minded guides. You also had stated uh, learning how to work on some of those earlier foundations. And so I'm curious what some of those earlier foundations were that you discovered were really critical in your work in, with, with the children. Yeah, so, well, um, the, the main ones, I guess, those really early uh, foundations like emotional attunement. Um, mm -hmm. We do, of course, we know in our work with kids prior to this training, I knew what it looked like for a child to be attuned, but I didn't necessarily know the importance of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I could maybe do things to get the child to attend to me. Um, and so all of us who work with children and who work with difficult to engage children can relate to that where we're running almost a three ring circus and you're kind of sweating trying to, trying to help this child attune to you and to engage. Um, it wasn't until the RDI program that I really learned how important that developmental foundation is and that the type of communication that we use and our interaction style and some of the other supports that we can provide in terms of how we frame those engagements uh, really helped me to be able to help the child to develop that attunement. So being able to coach the parent on um, their communication style, you know, using a more declarative style or more commenting style, um, really being able to slow down our pace was another thing. You know, as a speech pathologist, we tend to be quite data driven and we're trying to achieve a certain number of objectives in a certain period of time. And so mm -hmm. RDI really gave me that, um, that knowledge about how important it is to slow down and, and all of the pausing that we use, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So found, like a lot of those earlier foundations and so, and co-regulation even was a term that 
I first heard, I think the year before I started my RDI training, um, I listened to a presenter from the Merit Center, Amanda Binns. She's a speech pathologist who does uh, research with them. Mm. And I went to a, a day long workshop with her and she introduced me to this term of co the, the, the idea of co-regulation. And I was familiar with self-regulation. I really wasn't familiar with co-regulation and the importance of it again and how it develops. So some of these earlier foundations that we know develop before even a year of age, like one year of age that are so critical and are really are gonna open up the pathways for, for all future development with any, any of the future foundations or skills. Um, so RDI was really, was really a door opening for me with all of that. And I feel like it was meant to be because I heard about co-regulation and I'd already spoken with you, Lisa, and th thought about, was I going to do this training and should I, should I go this path? And then all of a sudden it was like everywhere I looked and everything I read, these terms were coming up and everything I read about was all pointing in that direction of these, these earlier foundations. So yeah, mm -hmm. it was really exciting. And I think that it's even more understood as we understood, um, as we understand, as we as we gain more understanding even about uh, typical development, human development. In fact, I was listening to the Brain Architect Park podcast uh, through the uh, Child Center for Development through Harvard mm -hmm. earlier this year, and the host was talking about co-regulation as being a very critical foundation for childhood development. And in the podcast, they said. And it's not something that's well understood by the average lay person in terms mm -hmm. of its importance. And, you know, and, and, I, and I remember hearing that and just feeling so um, fortunate that with our experience in our education and RDI as clinicians that were trained to uh, understand co-regulation and then how to uh, establish it, how to help the parents establish it with their children, Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, it's just, it, it's such a critical step to self-regulation. In fact, mm -hmm. Dr. Gutstein says that uh, co-regulation is self-regulation with training wheels. <laughs> that was a really good put it. Yeah. yeah. So it's like that scaffolded supportive process and that we can't just throw children into the deep end of the pool and hope that they'll, you know, they're either going to sink or swim, but they've got to figure it out and they've got to develop their self-regulation on their own. It's, it's, I think it's just something that's not well understood in terms of how does one establish emotional and self-regulation. So, but it's, as we know, it's through the relationship. Absolutely. So, yeah. So it's yeah. Really cool. And parents make the best therapist in that they're with their children all day long and they know exactly where their children are at and, and, and they, they have those shared ex engagements and those shared experiences. So they are, are really the ones that should be educated and empowered first and foremost. Absolutely. And you, and you said something else that was interesting to me as well and that, you know, in, in, in terms of some of the work that you've done prior to learning about RDI and I feel that, you know, RDI's as a parent, because that's how I, my, I began my journey in RDI was as an RDI parent, it gave me the permission to slow down. Whereas mm -hmm. all these well-intended professionals were really encouraging me as a parent to do more, you know, that more was better. And once I was, um, had gained the permission through, you know, RDI to slow down, it just felt, everything just got easier. And it felt like I could finally see, because before that I just had these blinders on in the sense that I was always trying to get a specific response yes. from my kids or the therapists were always trying to get a specific response from my kids. And so it was driven by the data and often the engagements were, um, they, they, were they were set up to try to get that response versus thinking about giving it. And so in RDI, we often will say that, um, we're, you know, you want to try to think about giving versus getting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think in our professions, like I know in our profession of speech pathology, uh, when you're working for public agencies, there's that pressure as well. There's supposed to see so many clients in a day or in a week or carry a certain caseload and you have 30 minutes or you have 60 minutes and they want to see results and there's all of that pressure as well. So I think that 
we don't always have that ability to slow down and pause because we're trying, we're, we're required to meet these certain outcomes. So I think for me in private practice, it was really love. It's, it's always been really nice to be able to learn these things and be able to truly integrate them and really, and, and really implement them in a way that I know, um, you know, I'm, I've been shown is going to work. And then I found, yes, in fact, it does work. And I tell parents that as well, when you're engaging with your child, um, they might shift their gaze to you once in your entire interaction with them that maybe went on for 10 or 15 minutes, which is so much more powerful than a more directive approach where you'd be trying to get your child to look at you. So that one gaze shift can be, it is so much more meaningful and is going to lead to more growth and more development. It's really, it's that growth seeking motivation, that intrinsic motivation that is, is another thing that I just don't think that I um, really had a full understanding of its importance uh, again it's one of those things when you have a child who's intrinsically motivated you know what that looks like and what that feels like to engage with them but how do you actually facilitate or help support a child's development of that when it when they don't have it and, and how important that is and that everything is going to stem from that um, so Yes, I totally agree with you. Um, as parents, we really want our children to want to learn without feeling like they have to have some kind of prize attached to it or that we have to try to um, force the learning, you know, on, on the kids. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, that, that how do you teach it? You know, you really can't teach a girl seeking mindset at the table. You have to have the real world meaningful experiences where the kids are have the opportunity to experience their own sense of self and their own agency for that growth mindset to develop. And that once you do develop that growth mindset, I mean, do that through the guiding relationship, then what we see, then, then all of the other goals that we can try to work on, the, the targets that we're trying to hit, if you will, all of that is just becomes like icing on the cake because now we've got the child's motivations. I guess it would be the same with communication. You can try to force a child to communicate, but really you want to build through the attunement, through the relationship, we want to build the motivations to want to communicate first right. and foremost. Yeah. Which, you know, and then that's when I learned that the skills are sort of the icing on the cake. And if you're trying to put icing on when there's no cake yet, you're not really going to have much that's going to, it's going to melt away. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's really, it really is important. And I, I love, I love being able to work with parents to help them to understand that and for them to be able to not let go of skills. The skills are all part of their, their dreams and their hopes for their kids, but it's just, it's all about those foundations and, and that those take time and that we're going to work with them as a family individually to develop those solidly. And then those skills, the skills will come. That's the other thing as a speech pathologist, I was astounded to see is that so many of the skills that I was trying to elicit from these kids, uh, I didn't have to really work on them necessarily, <laughs> which is really amazing. So kids that I maybe would have set goals for, uh, spoken language, vocabulary development, um, use of sentences. There are a lot of kids now I've worked with where I don't, or turn taking, for example, as a, as a, a, a skill unto itself, haven't had to really work on those anymore because the reason they were missing was the missing foundations. And once those were in place, then along come the skills, right? And mm -hmm. so it's been really amazing to see that. It's changed my work so drastically that, um, in some ways, it's 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 almost not the same work anymore. I've become more of a uh, a support and facilitator for those foundations, and then because I have the knowledge and skills to be able to help for those kids that do need skill work afterwards, we can do that. But I'm not having to do as much of that anymore. Mm, that's yeah. so powerful, and what a wonderful discovery for you to have experienced yourself. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm pretty sure I know there was one training session I was in with you and our group. And I think my mic was on and I should have had it muted because I think I just like exclaimed like, wow, like I just, <laughs> I was just amazed. I forget. I don't even remember what it was, but it was sort of like, I always knew that there was more to it. I always knew that there were things that missing or pieces missing, that there was something that I could be doing differently or I could be doing better. And I, I just didn't know what it was. And then once it was, it was like the missing pieces for me in terms of 
wow. how to help those things happen. Yeah. Well, I, I don't remember what it was exactly either, but I'm sure glad that you had your mic uh, on because I'm sure it really delighted me to have that feedback from you. <laughs> Yeah, maybe it wasn't my most professional moment, but I feel like, I think it maybe had something to do with analyzing children's gaze or something. Oh, but yeah, yeah. That, that's a big, powerful session. I think it was that session. And I just mm -hmm. remember whatever you said, it was just all of a sudden I thought, that's, that's what, that's, that's awesome. why, like, that's why now I get it. Now I understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it was missing for me. So, yeah. Yes. That's one of my favorite topics, actually. I have many, but learning how to analyze children's gaze shifting within the context of what they're doing helps me as a clinician to learn when the functions are in place and when they're not. So that, um, yeah, so I can tell when the child has the function of being interested in other people's perspectives or when they can continually, um, when they're taking responsibility to monitor their actions in relationship to another person's actions? Are they maintaining their states of coordination? Um, what's the impact of my actions on, you know, on, on my partner? Because, you know, the, the, the child, when they shift their gaze in a specific moment, as in, do you like my idea? You know, if they're, if they're collaborating and so on. So I actually just did a, a training on that again, um, a two-part training. I just did that last month with the, with the latest set of, of um, consultants in training. So I, I think that, that it's quite enlightening. And for me, it was too, because um, to be frank, as, as you know, I came to RDI as a parent and I can remember before my child's diagnosis that I kept calling his name all the time because of course I'm panicked and I'm thinking, why don't you seem to be responsive to me? And can you hear me? You know, and, and you know, questioning his hearing and, and just different things. And I think I probably got to the point where I called his name so many times that I think he learned to tune me out because I wasn't giving him a reason to look. Right. And so, exactly. you know, I call his name and he'd look and then, and then there was nothing to look at, you know. So in RDI, we learn how to set up the engagements with the kids to help them to... Um, really appraise what's most meaningful at any given time and the parents learn how to to help spotlight you know the most important aspects of what we're doing because that can be difficult for kids on the spectrum as well to learn out to learn what's what's um a really central piece of, yeah. of what is happening versus uh you know a peripheral piece yes yeah, yeah. i just had a conversation with a family a parent the other day and she what mom was saying how she just she she noticed that her child was starting to notice so like the word notice which i thought this is great because what she meant was he was he's starting he's stopping now and he's taking notice of those critical parts of whatever the interaction or the activity is and that was really powerful and i thought that word notice is even just because notice implies an intrinsic right you can't, you're not, you can't prompt someone to notice. They have, that's something that comes from inside where they're just taking, taking stock and, and observing it for themselves. And I, I think another thing that was powerful for me with that session as a speech pathologist was the study gaze, because I really believe that most of us who work with children and have all those pressures and demands to uh, meet certain numbers and time frames and it's data driven is we are constantly interrupting the study gaze or we're not pausing long enough for the child to even shift their attention and study something. And so that's a like sort of a rule I develop early on with the families that I work with is we don't interrupt that study, that study gaze. We might join them to gaze or we might um, add a comment about what the, what the child's gazing at or looking at, but we no longer are going to try to, to, to make that child shift their attention away to something else, even when it's not part of the plan. And so that's really powerful as well. And, and it wasn't something I'd ever thought about because it's, you know, in my training, we talked about eye contact. And so a steady gaze, is usually not eye contact of any kind, um, but it's so meaningful in terms of, like you said, telling, it gives you information about what the child's thinking, mm -hmm. about what they're noticing, about what maybe they haven't quite figured out yet and that's what they're studying and so yeah the gazing is, is a really big piece of the training that helped me a lot i agree and with a relatively new client of mine i think that she's done a very good job in 
and noticing her child's steady gaze. And that has helped further facilitate her ability to slow down and to become that good observer. And she does a beautiful job putting words to what she thinks. And I, and I can tell by the videos when I review them that she's pretty accurate, but it, it helping him to support his communication too, because she's putting words to what he's thinking or the actions that he's taking or potentially, and not in such a way that's taking away, you know, mm. from, from oh. what's going on by any means. I think it's giving more, um, it, it, it's helping to, to really um, encourage his studying and, to, and, and her ability to just be a good observer so that she can um, co-regulate with him in a while and that, you know, she's not speeding up too fast. She's really acknowledging his, yeah. his thought and his actions as being very intentional. And they, and they are. So it, it's, it's been beautiful. It's beautiful to see that. So thanks for sharing that with me. I wanted to ask you, how has COVID affected your work in terms of what does that look like now? Yeah, so I think it's affected everyone's work. It's affected everyone's lives. Uh, but from the perspective of uh, RDI work with families, I don't feel like it's had uh, any negative impact. I have had um, some of the families that I work with have really been going through a difficult time during COVID. Uh, they're in survival mode, for mm -hmm. sure. And so with those families, in some ways, our, the objectives that we've been focusing on have shifted a bit. Uh, we maybe have gone back to some of our early parent objectives, like managing crisis mindset or moving out of that crisis mindset or they're realizing that they're still more in crisis than they thought for example um, so sometimes for some families the objectives have changed but for the majority of families if anything because we aren't having those every I usually meet with families every two weeks and then they're working with their kids in between uh, on their own uh, if anything it's enhanced the my practice in terms of my ability to really shift that onus to the parents so a lot of parents will like me to demonstrate for example uh certain working on certain objectives and i'm happy to do that so COVID has limited us in that way so for some families that had already been working with me for some time i found that they were they are now more confident just taking the reins from the beginning without feeling like they really need to see this in action first that they can they can just, we have our conversation. Uh, we might look at some other uh, examples and, and we talk about the strategies and they come up with a plan and we're doing that while we meet virtually and then they're just sort of taking it and running with it. So that's been great. Um, but I've even been able to work with brand new families uh, doing RDI since COVID started. So some families that didn't start with me until April or May uh, and one in June actually. So we've been able to adapt the RDA to be able to do the assessment portion online. Um, there's, there's that in-person piece that's missing, but I've been able to adapt things so that I feel like we're still getting um, essentially the entire RDA and, and the quality of it is definitely still there. And um, then the, our work together has been uh, awesome. Actually, these parents have really been able to uh, start the program, um, meet every two weeks with me. They're on track with their goals and objectives. So it really hasn't impacted things a whole lot. But although I do acknowledge that for different families, the, the stress levels have been different. Uh, for some families, the stress has been far less because parents are not running the roads with their kids do, doing all of the same things that they normally do so there wasn't school and all of the extracurricular activities and that's been a big relief for some families a lot of parents feel calmer their their kids are feeling calmer um, some kids have really shown uh, great gains more gains during this time i think because of those lower stress levels families uh, some families have more time uh, now to to be guiding their child and to be working on those objectives so it's been really, uh, really neat to see. I, I wouldn't have thought I was, I was worried about it in the beginning. I was worried about the impact on families and how it would influence my work. Um, but it's been, it's, it's gone fairly well. And the other thing as a professional is it gave me um, a, a bit more time to develop in the beginning of COVID uh, some things that I've been working on for ideas I've been working on for a long time. And one of them was a webinar series. 
um, I had planned to be meeting in person with small groups of parents just to go through some of the early parts of the RDI program um, in those early stages of learning because I felt like every day I'm sort of repeating some of the same things and I thought it'd be great to bring parents together in a group and so that was supposed to launch in May so instead I launched it as a, a webinar series and it just went really well. Uh, we had 14 people in our first group and I have a waiting list um, to run them again uh, this month. So yeah, so it's been going really well. And so that was something that, yeah, that I think that uh, I just having that extra time and just kind of pushing myself forward to have the confidence to do the webinar series because I haven't done that before. I'm a very in-person uh, kind of person. Yeah. Uh, my technology knowledge has jumped incredibly in the last few months and uh, yeah, the webinar series went, went really well. So I think that following COVID, I probably will maintain that afterwards. Um, I could not believe the increase in learning and ability to apply what I was sharing by the parents through a webinar format. So even some of my parents who have been with me for a long time, Mm -hmm. They took part in the webinar series and I told them at the beginning, I think you know a lot of this stuff because we've talked about it. I saw such a huge change in their own guiding practice and I'm not sure, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out why that is. Um, I'm not sure. I think one parent told me, because um, I've asked all the parents what their thoughts were on that. Why did you find this format so helpful? And one parent said that she said, I know I'm sitting by myself in front of my screen and I have my headphones on, but she said, I know there are other parents here with me. And she said, when you're telling us the information, you're not specifically talking about my child per se, you're just talking about the information. And she said for her, it felt like a, a comfortable way to hear the information. And she felt like she was part of a collective of people that are probably experiencing similar things. Um, and when we're in session and her child's there, she said her attention is divided, you know, between her child and maybe what we're talking about, etc. So the webinar format was seemed really helpful um, for a lot of parents. Another thing that they said was that it was just that dedicated time. We did Wednesday lunch and learn. So every Wednesday at noon, they knew that time was set aside. They've made arrangements for their children otherwise, and they could just devote that time. But I really saw a huge change in, in parents' knowledge and, and, and application of what they were learning. So, so I'll definitely hang on to that when we're finished with this. Oh, that's wonderful. Very normal, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I do, yeah, who knows what is going, the future will look like when, when COVID is gone. And it will, it will be gone one day. I'm confident of that. But... Uh, you know, I think that a lot of people will, will live different lives at that time and, and maybe they will choose to do less because their lives were just, you know, less hectic and less stressful. And so in that way, learning from home or working from home, um, spending more time, you know, with, with their kids, because I mean, that's one of the beautiful things that I've seen in my own neighborhood. I've gotten to know a lot more of my neighbors and I've seen all these wonderful just uh, my heart is really warmed by how many family bike rides i've seen and family walks and you just hear people playing in their backyard and you walk you know at dusk i'm walking through the neighborhood and i see the you know lights on in the in the at the kitchen table and everybody's clearly playing a you know a board game i, I mean everybody's kind of getting back to normal but i am seeing that, that the time that people are spending with their families has really appear to have continued so that's that's really beautiful but I'm I'm quite happy to hear that you've had such good success with your webinar series too and that you know continue to be, the opportunity to continue to do that even long after COVID is is uh, probably going to be a very um, positive opportunity for families to engage in even when they can see you or come in person because you provide that that opportunity for community without the need for travel. It's convenient, yeah. right? I've worked with families myself at a distance for well over a decade, and I have clients from all over the world, actually probably for <clears throat> over 15 years now. And, and, I've, and I, so I've been working virtually with families for a very long time, and I found myself, I found the work to be very meaningful in that I've been able to provide so, um, support 
and education for families in, in sometimes in areas of the world that wouldn't be able to access it otherwise. Right. And so that's been, it's been really wonderful as well. Awesome. And I think that that idea of providing that community, so when you're there with those parents and they're all meeting together, that they know that they're not alone and that there's other people that are experiencing the same thing. So, yeah. Well, yeah, and what the, the latest thing uh, that's come out of it is the webinars ended in June, the first series, and a couple of parents said they'd like to keep something going, so now we're forming a parent networking group that is gonna meet a uh, similar, like a lunchtime type of format, where they're just going to be able to share and talk about uh, different successes, concerns, um, what brought them to RDI? Um, yeah, so so I'm going to facilitate that as well. Yeah, and you can continue to choose like little little specific topics. Yeah, to to talk about spotlighting, for example, yes. like indirect influence, or I don't know, personalized supports, anything. I think it's a really fascinating way to continue to empower and educate parents. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had heard that you were doing that, so I'm really glad that it was so successful. Yeah, it, it really was. I was I was very nervous about it. It's not something I'd ever done before, and I'm I'm very comfortable now. After about my third webinar, I I had like the first couple of webinars were really nerve wracking, and then I got into the third webinar, and I was like, no, this is this is good. So you got this. Yeah. I got this. Yeah. yeah, and it's important to always remember too that it's about helping. The parents right and and when I I know myself I felt anxious before about presenting but when I put myself in the in the role of you know I'm just here to help to help and when I do that then then I don't worry about the rest of it <laughs> yeah you forget yourself in it yeah. right? and, you become, and that's how I felt too I knew I knew the group well that attended the webinars and so I was able to present on that information but still be keeping all of their individual kids in mind mm -hmm. and sort of touching and, and on certain things more than others just knowing knowing who I had in the group and that was really helpful too yeah so, so thank you for sharing that so you said that they were people that you already had worked with so what about new families people that are brand new to RDI or maybe your services is there are you opening it up that way to yeah to the, the second series and actually the first series uh, that I ran this spring it did include some families who are accessing speech language pathology services from me but not RDI mm -hmm. but are interested in RDI so they've sort of asked me about it and for whatever reason haven't felt ready or they weren't sure that's what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I had a few families that actually had never really had any exposure to RDI, but they know me well um, from other sort of other work that we've done together. Then I had the rest of them were currently receiving RDI, but some had just started, like just had the RDA done. Others have been with me for two years or a year. Um, and then there were two actually speech pathologists that joined us that kind of banged their way in. I said no at first because I thought this is just for our families. It's going to be very tailored towards families. And these ladies are lovely and really want to learn more. And they work, they work in a school board here. And so they really wanted to take part. And so I said, okay, you guys can take part as well. And you can give me feedback, which I thought would be great. So this next uh, series though, or the next time I run it, um, it's going to include, again, it'll be a mixture. There's a couple of families who are, are um, doing RDI with me and then some who aren't and want to hear more about it. And a couple of them are professionals that just want to learn more about it as well, like just to learn different ways to do their job. So I haven't decided if I'm going to start creating different streams, depending, I think it's all going to be fairly general to start out with this first few times, yeah. I'm wondering what is it, what would you like to tell other people that might be considering RDI professional training? I think I would tell them to do it first and foremost, that's the short version. Uh, I think that knowing that there are earlier developmental foundations that they don't already know about um, maybe don't know about at all or maybe don't know how to facilitate help support the development of I think it's important for them to know that that is going to make all the difference for their practice um, I think that it's important for other professionals to know that it's not going to take away anything from your current 
training or your current expertise, it's only going to add to that. It's only going to make you a stronger and better clinician. Um, you're going to see change in kids that you didn't think was possible or more change than, that, than what you thought was possible. And that that work with parents where you're really handing over the reins to them or not, they, you don't even have the reins, they have the reins right from the beginning um, is such rewarding and work at, with much powerful, much more powerful outcomes. And so I think just keeping those things in mind uh, is checking it out further and really investigating if it would be a good fit for you. And, and I haven't talked to any professionals yet who regretted um, doing the training. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm so glad that you did. Yes, thank you. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful I met you. I remember the first day I phoned you in your kitchen. I think you just answered the phone one day and I don't even remember how I got your name. I can't remember, but it was really... Uh, I do, from another colleague of yours. Yes. Was it? Yes, yeah, from a colleague that's here in, in my neck of the woods, in my town. Oh, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. you are right. That's right. I, I, just I, it. I think you knew from somebody else, so it's kind of yes. like a small world. Yes. Yeah. And I was searching and I was searching and something just kept pushing me to search further. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, I feel like my practice really was those kids that I would leave their house and I'd, I would have worked so hard and, and not really gotten to where I knew this, I could, I could help this child or this family get to. Those were the kids that I, I take home at night and I would think about and drove me to really find something more effective where I could really have make change it was those kids that really you know and families that motivated me to keep looking for something and definitely found it so oh well thank you so much and thank you for your time today i really appreciate it thank you lisa it was a pleasure yeah,